stealth as a genre is one of gaming's oldest worn, going all the way back to 1981's Castle Wolfenstein. This predates even the first Mario game, which would release two years later. Yet the modern stealth genre was slow to develop, unlike other series, which can much easier trace their lineage in a more understandable pattern. In fact, the modern stealth genre didn't really begin to plant its roots until the late 1990s and early 2000s with the release of three pivotal series, Thief, Metal Gear Solid, and Splinter Cell. They've all been running since the 90s and early 2000s and all share their ups and downs. Splinter Cell arguably peaked in the early 2000s with Chaos Theory and has been trending downwards ever since with rumors of a new Splinter Cell in the works during the making of this video. Thief peaked with the second game, and although its immediate sequel wasn't terrible, was definitely a bit of a step back when it came to the level design, and the modern reboot is a notorious flop. Metal Gear Solid 1 through 3 are universally beloved, the fourth is fairly divisive, and the fifth was unfortunately meddled with in development, not reaching its full potential. There's a common theme among all of these long-lasting series. Today, they are all in tumultuous situations, either failing to reach critical or commercial success, or with recent entries featuring all-consuming development problems. Outside of the three genre-defining successes sits another stealth series that shares a similar time frame for its releases, and the thing that makes it unique among its peers is that it's not only going strong today, but is arguably at its best ever. Just now, finally realizing the potential the series showcased all the way back in the early 2000s. Hitman is a series of stealth action titles that set itself apart from all the others in gameplay, style, overall design, and character. Hitman was a groundbreaking stealth title because it offered a novel and unique stealth experience compared to other titles at the time. Its competitors were following similar formulas when it comes to detection and stealth systems, how they valued killing and their mission design. The stealth system its competitors showcased were all about light and dark. Thief and Splinter Cell are all about skulking around in the shadows, about manipulating the environment to create as much darkness as possible to avoid being seen. They varied in their approaches to violence as well. Thief heavily discouraged killing, not because of a gimmicky moral choice system, but because killing was messy and loud and difficult. You are instead incentivized to avoid guards altogether or to quickly knock them out with a blackjack. Splinter Cell also incentivizes you to avoid guards if possible, but allows you to very quickly and easily take out guards with silenced weapons. In mission structure, both were varied and unpredictable from mission to mission. In Thief, a good amount of missions were almost entirely based around stealing things. The second mission in the game is literally about stealing enough items to pay the rent. More complicated, story-focused objectives come in the game later, but earlier missions were about simple, reasonable objectives. Splinter Cell is more about mission-specific objectives, like listening in on a conversation or destroying some important objective. Hitman differs on all of these fronts. Its stealth system is its most definitive and distinct feature. It's not about creeping around in the shadows and avoiding guards. Instead, it's about blending in, taking a disguise and fooling guards into thinking you belong instead of avoiding them entirely. It's not line of sight stealth, it's social stealth. The disguise system is instead about long-term layers of infiltration, about escalating in disguises until you get one that's important enough to let you into just about anywhere. It also means confrontation with guards is likely, as not every level leaves disguises around for you to find. Hitman values pacifism along with Thief, and yes, I am aware of the irony of that. No, instead what that means is that Hitman discourages you from killing anyone but your target with its rating system. Its rating system values a killer that can seamlessly and invisibly take out their target without any guards being able to identify anyone for the crime. Killing other guards, being spotted, leaving evidence of bodies are all things that decrease your rating throughout the mission. Hitman does give you a compromise by allowing you to non-lethally neutralize a target or two per level depending on the individual game in the series. Hitman 2 gives you an anesthetic. Hitman Contracts and Blood Money give you a sedative. Hitman Absolution has a chokehold. And Hitman 2016 allows you to use miscellaneous items like soda cans and crowbars to neutralize your enemies. In early titles, it's an excruciating, clunky process. In later titles, it eventually develops into a virtually unlimited and relatively easy and useful way to deal with hostile guards. 
and its mission design is unique among stealth games because it remains almost universally consistent between missions and games. Each mission tasks you with taking out either a single or multiple targets and occasionally a side objective tacked on like blowing up a submarine or getting access to a certain file. Organically, each mission plays similarly, which could be taken as a flaw, but instead cementing a reliable, achievable, and familiar objective for each mission allows the level design to take over on the creative front. Navigating the levels and learning how its moving parts work and how to manipulate them is the real challenge of each level, not the specific objective. It differs even more in playable character, which is notable for having an unquestionable bad guy as the protagonist in its series. Now, Garrett in Thief isn't a shining symbol of morality, but he's very clearly an anti-hero. He cares about two things, money and the thrill of stealing. He wants to steer clear of major conflicts and politics and live a simple life of thieving enough money to live. Sam Fisher leans more towards a straightforward action hero, but doesn't have any qualms about killing, and in later entries, turns into an ultra-violent punishment type out for revenge. Agent 47 is parallel with neither of these character types. He's an amoral, emotionless hired killer. He doesn't take pleasure in killing, but that's because he doesn't take pleasure in anything. He's more or less a tool for the agency and a tool for anyone with big enough pockets to hire an assassin as skilled as himself. He very occasionally shows scant signs of morality, like with his admiration for Father Vittorio, but for the vast majority of these games, he's a blank, emotionless slate out to complete a job as emotionally detached and efficiently as possible. Hey there, stud. You're not alone, are ya? I'm unaccompanied, if that's what you mean. It's so refreshing. There's no moralizing or pretensions of 47 being anything other than a bad guy who kills people for money. The games go to great lengths to make 47's targets irredeemable pieces of shit, but they never for a second try to portray 47 as a hero or even remotely a good person. It's unique, and it allows these games to remain tonally consistent and treat story and plot as a kind of inconsequential bridge between missions instead of a primary driver of the gameplay experience. So with that out of the way, we're going to start with Hitman Codename 47. <laughs> so, I wanted to make this a full series retrospective, but this game... Yeah, it's, it's interesting to try a play in 2018. I wanted to feature it for the historical value, but the game even refused to cooperate with that. <laughs> Now, thankfully Hitman Contracts, the third title in this series, remakes a few of the original game's levels, so we will be able to experience at least part of it together. Instead, we will start with Hitman 2, Silent Assassin. Hitman 2 is the first game in the series most fans consider to be worth your time because of how poorly the original has aged with modern technology. Really, the vast majority of mechanics and design the next five games follow can be traced back to this game. Large hostile levels with moving parts of NPCs, interactable objects, and timed events. Even though the design is strikingly similar, this game is still very much mired in the time it released. You would never mistake Hitman 2 for Hitman 2. God, these naming schemes are the worst. It is very much a product of its time, even though much of its design is very forward-thinking. It's kind of amazing, though, just how much they got right this early. The soundtrack especially, composed by Jesper Kidd, is incredible, and this is a theme that will continue throughout the series. A lot of it isn't fully thought out, but there's so much promise presented here that the next five games will gradually refine into something much greater. The mechanics in Hitman 2 betray a lot of that promise. This game is antiquated and clunky in a way that its peers are not. The social stealth mechanics are not fully matured yet, and this is the cause for the most frustration in the game. In this world, running is an offense punishable by death. Jesus, I was just going for a little jog. 
for whatever reason, walking like you were trying to tiptoe through a set of laser traps is considered normal person behavior, while sprinting, or in reality walking at a normal speed, is seen as instant heresy and reveals your true lizard self, so you must be purged for the good of the world immediately. The line between totally safe and compromised is too binary with very little middle ground or room for forgiveness. If you do something a guard doesn't like, you are dead, immediately, on the spot. This is made worse by some painfully obvious oversights like the indulgent length of the knockout or fiber wire animations and the most ridiculous stealth mode I have ever seen in my life. Take this for example. I want this driver's disguise so that I can plant a car bomb on this car without being detected. So you have to wait a good 5 minutes for him to walk all the way to this alley, but once he's out of sight, you can't just walk up behind him and knock him out. No, of course not. If you walk up behind him, he'll immediately turn around and run away. He walks faster than your stealth speed, so you can't get him in that, either. No, instead you have to wait all the way until he gets to this corner and ah! He turns around in just a couple seconds, too. You have to perfectly plan this whole scenario and be at the perfect distance between him and the corner ahead of time so that you can time the stealth mode walk into a KO with the anesthetic. Or you could just shoot him, which I always do because fuck the stealth system in this game. Trying to get Silent Assassin or avoiding killing guards is made to be teeth-grindingly, mind-numbingly laborious and frustrating. Constantly reloading over and over again just to get the stars to align perfectly to score a disguise or a critical action is punishing in a way that is not fun and discourages experimentation and exploration. The disguise system has similar oversights that will later be corrected, and then re-screwed up before being corrected again. Did I mention this is a very inconsistent series? It's at its all-time worst in this game, not being fully matured and thought out properly. A disguise is not a foolproof guarantee to wander areas freely in this game. Some would argue this is a good thing, as it makes the game more realistic and challenging, and I would agree to a point. The problem is not the idea. The idea is that by using a disguise, you will be totally incognito at a distance, but will arouse suspicion up close, which makes sense. Guards will recognize their peers after a fair amount of time and would be instantly suspicious if one of them suddenly changed appearance. But the execution leaves much to be desired. Because of the painfully slow walking speed and instant turnaround of enemies when nearing them, they had to resort to some absurd workarounds in narrow hallways. The first and second basement of Tubeway Torpedo is a series of long, narrow corridors with guards patrolling up and down in set patterns. Knowing what you now know about how the disguise system works that you can be compromised by getting too close to a guard and that you can't walk or sprint past them, how exactly are you supposed to get past a guard walking in the same direction as you are? Easy, they put these little alcoves every few steps around this area. You are supposed to hide in these things as they pass, as to not show your face and then walk past them. This looks natural. So the attempt at creating realism has backfired spectacularly in some circumstances and does more to make the game more tedious than it already is. These oversights apply to the game's mission design as well, which is much more limited than future titles. Hitman is known for its sandbox levels, encouraging exploration and creativity, allowing the player numerous ways to assassinate their targets. This is before most of that really materialized. You can shoot them, or you can stab them, or you can strangle them, and that's basically all the tactical options at your disposal for much of the game. You have to do things sometimes exactly the way they want it, and sometimes that can be extremely vague and confusing. The main objective in Tubeway Torpedo is to kill this general and save a prisoner, except they are in a constantly watched, locked room. To my knowledge, the general never leaves, so the only option is to barge in and shoot the general and then flee the facility with the prisoner blowing up a chunk of wall on the way out and then fleeing the guards in hot pursuit. Yeah, that was totally silent. Hitman is at its best when it lets the player determine how they want to deal with their targets and how they want to escape. Boiling all the possible actions down into one specific scripted chain of events is very obnoxious and grates against the much more open sandbox levels in the game. The problem is that the balance of linear missions to sandbox missions is skewed so far in the wrong direction that this game doesn't play to the series' strengths the vast majority of the time. Hitman 2 has the most missions of any game in the franchise with 21 total levels, 
more than double what's in the next two games in the series, but only a scant few are what I would consider quote-unquote Hitman quality levels. So many of these levels feel like a tedious waste of time being either absurdly overcomplicated and gigantic, or being laughably simplistic to the point of being borderline useless. No sequence of levels better demonstrates these two extremes better than Tracking Hayamoto in the Hidden Valley. Tracking Hayamoto, I think, might be the smallest level in the entire franchise. This is the whole level. This fenced-in area outside the house, and then the house itself, which consists of a garage, a couple of back rooms, and then the main room where your target resides. It takes about 5 seconds. This level is completely pointless to even bother being inconspicuous because you can just run in, shoot your target, and about 5 guards, and then leave in 30 seconds flat. I don't even know why this is a level, there's so little to it that it makes the tutorial levels look like massive cityscapes by comparison. And yet the level that follows immediately after is one of the largest and most dangerous levels in the game. It's this massive open snowy plain with a huge tunnel network and snipers and guard towers watching over the area. Your goal is to find a hidden passage but the level is so enormous and absolutely filled with hostile NPCs who will run up to you and check for ID, even if in disguise that it overstays its welcome. It overstays its welcome so much that I eventually just started running through the level shooting everything because the tedium of trying to get into one of these trucks which takes you to the hidden passage is outrageously overcomplicated and poorly designed. These levels completely run counter to Hitman's strengths as a franchise. Assassinating your targets is supposed to be the main thing. It is called Hitman after all, and yet the level where the goal to, is to do just that is given a level the approximate size of a cheap condo, and the level where the goal is to hop in the back of a truck is given a multi-level outdoor sandbox with no actual point and 90% of it. The levels are an inconsistent mess. Only one in every four or five levels is a level with a clear target and sandbox design. The rest are either extremely linear or these connecting levels that don't play to the series' strengths or serve any real purpose in immersing you in the game or providing a fun challenge. I don't have a lot to say about this game because of how annoying this game is to play. This game gets so much right so early level design, art style, tone, and soundtrack, but it all gets overshadowed by the raw emotion of just how frustrating this game is to play. When slow boiling anxiety and bemused anger is the primary emotion experience when playing, it just makes all the things the game does right fall by the wayside. Hitman 2 is a difficult game to judge in this way. For diehard series fans, and for the very few interested in the historical value of where the series came from, this is a game worth experiencing. To everyone else, literally anybody else, Hitman 2 is an impenetrable fortress of tedium that will drive even the most dedicated and patient players to, into complete and total madness. Hitman Contracts is not a drastic overhaul of the game's surface features. The interface is almost identical. The mechanics are very similar, and the level design and mission structure has hardly been changed. Instead, what Contracts does well, better than any other Hitman game I've played, is Atmosphere. Contracts is unique among Hitman games. It's bleak, it's surreal, and it's ethereal. Everything is grounded in this hazy, dreamlike quality, from the literally hazy cutscenes to the depraved, neon-drenched sex clubs, the dirty, grungy biker bars, and the decrepit, desolate city streets. There's almost no consistently in the visual themes and levels, but the atmosphere, mostly achieved by Jesper Kidd's astoundingly good score, is consistent throughout all of the levels. Consistently forward and oppressive. It's cold, it's precise, and it's surprisingly dark and creepy. Some of the tracks in the game sound like they'd be more appropriate for Silent Hill than a Hitman game, but it gives the sneaking and infiltrating a much more dangerous, forbidden feel than any of the other games.
The mechanics, however, do not. They are the most similar to Silent Assassin, but the game has thankfully eased up a bit on how easy it is to be detected, although still not fully matured into the system that later games use. You still have to be careful about getting too close to guards wearing similar uniforms, but it feels much more consistent in the amount of time and space you have to work with than Silent Assassin, which does a lot to lessen the frustration. The detection due to your cover being blown still feels as random as ever though. When targets die or major events happen, it just seems to be a free-for-all in which guards detect you and from which distance. After sniping my target on this level for example, it puts all nearby guards on alert because of the gunshot. Okay, this makes sense, so I'll just slowly make my way over here and what the hell? I just started randomly getting shot by only this one guard for some reason. He didn't see anything, I shot on the other side of the wall from him. The walking speed and sneak mode are still big problems in how frustratingly slow they are, but finally, sprinting is not an instant death sentence, and guards will only become faintly suspicious if you are seen sprinting near them instead of marking you for death. This does a lot to mitigate reloading checkpoints as you aren't forced to painfully slow walk the same corridors ad nauseum. It's not perfect, and definitely still feels creaky and old compared to later titles, but it's kind of amazing just how much more polished and contemporary it feels compared to Silent Assassin, which only released three years earlier. With some minor tweaks and a considerable bump to style and atmosphere, Contracts feels much less antiquated. Unfortunately, the level design doesn't really pull its weight in this aspect. It's still very inconsistent, with some levels being early series highlights and some of the series' most standout and definitive levels, and some being horrendously antiquated and overbearing in the mission design. Some levels are somehow both too limited and too large, with tons of wasted space. The level Bajarkov? Bjarkov? Yarkov? Bjarkov. Bomb is a massive open snowy plain with only four real essential buildings, the two submarine bases on opposite ends of the map from another, an entire warehouse dedicated to holding one item, a radiation suit, and a camp right next to the plane at the beginning. This level is one of the most atmospheric in the game, and the open space is essential to that, but it backfires when it's designed in a way to deliberately waste as much of your time as possible. There's so much waiting around for your targets to get into place, and so much running around the map, like how you have to circle the entire submarine to plant bombs on its side, and then run all the way back around just to get back to the shore, instead of using this little ramp place just to troll the player. Contracts has a lot of oversights that way. Its atmosphere is timeless, and its graphics look pretty good for its age, but the level design and the inconsistent stealth mechanics date the game more than its presentation. Even though some levels overstay their welcome, that problem is not universal. Contracts has some of the most distinctive and memorable levels in the series, even if their design is a bit limited compared to later games in the series. The Beldingford Manor is an uncharacteristically straightforwardly creepy level with gothic architecture that feels like it would be more at home in an early 2000s survival horror game than in a Hitman game, but it's a surprisingly effective and unique level that contrasts well with the military and criminal underground levels. Its design is still really not that great with more tons of wasted space and awkward guard placement, but the visual theme and atmosphere of the level is fantastic and it contains one of the series' first steps towards creativity and tactical options for assassinating your targets. You can actually smother one of your targets in bed with a pillow inches away from his wife. This is pretty tame compared to the Rube Goldberg machine precarious assassinations and later Hitman titles, but it marks an important stepping stone away from the cold and precise fiber wire or silver baller kills that characterize earlier games and the overcomplicated accident kills of later games. Traditions of the Trade is one of Contract's remakes of an original Hitman codename 47 level, and it was a good choice to update. It's one of the best levels of the early Hitman games, showing a level of detail and intimacy with the environment that only later Hitman games can really claim. It takes place inside a multi-story hotel with dozens of rooms to enter and uncharacteristically, some pretty wide and varied options for assassinating your targets for this early in the series. Your first target can be strangled in the shower, but the second target has a large roaming AI pattern and will transition between two separate optimal kill points, a thermal bath where you can turn up the heat valves to burn him alive, or snipe him from a window above or just shoot him in the baths. He also roams over to a bar area where you can poison his drink 
think. Sometimes it can feel a little tonally dissonant because it's updated with Jesper Kidd's bleak and cold score over a much more classically spy-oriented level, but they even added a literal haunted area of the hotel with a ghost that roams the area. Because of the technological limitations of the time, a lot of this game's levels feel very bland and samey, reusing similar or identical textures to compensate for the enormous map size. Traditions of the Trade is the one level in the game where this actually works to enforce a feeling of isolation and order, as the entire level takes place inside this one hotel instead of a large swath of buildings and streets. The mission design suffers a similar inconsistency to the levels. It can be extremely vague and confusing, requiring reload after reload to figure out the exact chain of specific and hidden actions needed for the mission to work properly. Deadly Cargo is a particularly bad example of this. This level has some really cool elements, and if it was done with a little more freedom and a little less obnoxious waiting and accidental sequence breaking, it could have been a great level. There's a deal for a nuclear device on a cargo ship going down, and the nearby SWAT team is about to make a raid for the ship. You can get a SWAT team disguise and go on board the ship with them, which is a really good idea. The problem is that the sequence this whole raid goes down is awkward and clunky. At first, I went with the squad before getting impatient waiting around with nothing happening, so I went on board the ship myself to take out my target. I did, with a silenced pistol behind a door with no view of what was happening outside, and I was instantly compromised and shot at by every guard outside. No, instead what you are supposed to do is wait until the entire SWAT team is on the ship, then go and strangle him with a fiber wire in full view of everybody right in front of the window, and then literally sprint off the boat with the detonator in your hands and somehow none of them take any issue with this. It's completely absurd. Because Contracts wants to have these really cool scripted events, it can severely grate against the player's instincts to throw a wrench in the AI patterns and do their own strategies. These are the worst kind of missions because you have to do them one way. Now there are other options in the level, such as sniping or getting an alternate disguise and fighting the SWAT team, but it's frustrating how, but it's frustrating how limited some of the set paths can be. Inconsistency really sums up the Hitman Contracts experience. There was times when I was convinced this was some lost relic of stealth gaming and other times where I was reloading a checkpoint for the 10th time and screaming at my monitor trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. And yet even though this game is full of inconsistencies and crusty early 2000s game design annoyances, it isn't defined by them nearly as much as its predecessor. Because it has style, because it has a thick atmosphere, and because it has an unmistakable tone and distinct experience when compared to other Hitman titles, it has value for modern gamers. If you haven't played any of the early Hitman games, this is the one I would suggest first. Hitman Codename 47 is like a pre-alpha experiment of what the series would be like, and Hitman 2 is like an ultra-punishing purist masochistic nightmare that would be better served for absolute veterans and series diehards, ready to test their skills and their patience against the most brutally unforgiving Hitman game of them all. Contracts is the bridge between rusty and abrasive Hitman and soft and cushy Hitman. It has enough visual personality and style to connect it with newer Hitman games that makes it a worthwhile experience for modern gamers to look back on. Just make sure you get a tetanus shot before checking it out for yourself. Hitman Blood Money, the fourth game in the series, released in 2006 and is the fan favorite of the series. Hitman Blood Money is the first game in the series low on frustration and high in fun. Older titles violently seesawed between the two, depending on if you get stuck with a bad level or the detection systems were being vague and unwieldy. Blood Money is refined, consistent, and polished. Now it's got glitches, oh boy does it have some glorious ragdolls and some less forgivable bugs, but its systems and levels are a vast improvement on past titles. We'll start with its systems first. Blood Money is the first game in the series to actually be relatively consistent in how detection works. Instead of guards or NPCs with similar outfits becoming suspicious of your disguise, in Blood Money it is instead entirely restricted to areas. This means if you get a suit and tie guard disguise in You Better Watch Out for example, you are free to explore anywhere a guard is permitted without having to worry about other guards seeing through your disguise. Some people don't like this because it seems less realistic. You 
you'd think a guard would recognize an obviously pale, bald man, but the trade-off is that the game is much less frustrating and allows you to explore the levels freely without having to constantly worry about narrow hallways. Instead, Blood Money introduces a new system for detection. Notoriety is Blood Money's answer to guards seeing through your disguise, and instead of using hidden and nebulous stats that could result in frustration, it's instead a long-term status bar that can be influenced by the player in numerous ways. How it works is that the more attention you draw to yourself during missions, the more this notoriety bar will rise after the mission. This is even depicted visually with a little newspaper snippet at the end of each mission, and depending on how reckless you achieved your objective, it will determine how complete of a composite the witnesses are able to make of you. The more witnesses you leave, the more complete the sketch, and consequently, how easy it will be for guards to see through your disguise in later missions. The notoriety bar tracks from mission to mission, so playing recklessly in one mission will actually make future missions harder. Now, this system is not perfect. It's absurdly cheap and easy to pay to bring down any notoriety you might have accrued over the course of a mission, which does cheapen it. If you pay attention to the bar, it basically eliminates ever worrying about being caught while wearing a disguise. It shifts the focus away from the series stealth routes for much of its duration and instead onto manipulating AI patterns and navigating the levels. And the level design is really where Blood Money firmly establishes its dominance over the past titles in the series. Massive, dense, open levels with an absurd amount of moving parts and freedom. No more scripted sequences for targets or overbearing amounts of direction. This is the sandbox Hitman experience the series is known for. It just took four games to get there. Out of Hitman Blood Money's levels, a staggering percentage of them are classics. Curtains Down, A New Life, Till Death Do Us Part, A House of Cards, A Dance with the Devil, and Amendment 46. And I'd argue some of Blood Money's least talked about levels deserve a place there too, like Death on the Mississippi. They are massive, but not empty and full of wasted space. Absolutely packed with options and alternate routes and play styles without being overly engineered. A House of Cards is reminiscent of the Budapest Hotel from the original Hitman codename 47 and its remake in Contracts except this time it's three floors separating the top two from an elevator. Even though this level isn't the largest in physical size, it really feels like it because of the huge vertical distance the player travels and that there's actual interaction from the top floor to the bottom. You could call your target and lure him out onto the roof where he can be sniped from one of the top floor windows. This level is one where timing events across huge distances is its biggest challenge as you have to coordinate the AI patterns of Hendrik Smuts, who is selling a DNA case, and the Sheik himself who arrives in a limo a few minutes into the level. And unlike Deadly Cargo and Contracts, this is actually fun and well considered because you have a lot of freedom and options on how to deal with these two targets. There's no nebulously specific sequence of events to follow. You can strangle Smuts in the elevator, follow him to his room and kill him, or snipe him from the opposite side of the hotel's window to name a few. And the Sheik even has his own optional kill if you sneak into his room at the top of the hotel and use his bodyguard's phone to call him outside. A Dance with the Devil is Blood Money's best use of art style and scope with two themed parties to visit in a glitzy Vegas skyscraper. The top floor is heaven, with guests decorated in provocative angelic costumes and views of the city, and the bottom floor is hell, with provocative demon costumes and a mosh pit surrounded by a shark tank with a great white. Each party switches up the basic formula with multiple objectives and assassins hunting 47 along with the prime target. The assassin in heaven can be led into a private room but can instant kill you with a stiletto if not careful, and the assassin in hell challenges you to a duel in a soundproof room. It adds an extra incentive to explore this level further as it uses every square inch of this huge map for critical events, and it adds a ton of extra challenge for pro difficulty with no checkpoints. Having to get in a gun battle and a quick draw with the risk of starting from the very beginning if you fail. It seems to be most players' favorite level, and it's hard not to see why. The visual theme and art style is the best the series has seen since the Meat King's party back in Hitman Contracts. And yet, Blood Money's best level is the complete opposite to A Dance with the Devil in design and style. A New Life is Blood Money's smallest level set in a suburban neighborhood. All it consists of is a street with a couple of back houses, 
an FBI van, and the main house itself with a pool and a backyard. Yet this level has zero wasted space. Zero. It is jam-packed with options, from dropping off poison donuts to the FBI agents, taking a clown's disguise, shooting a guard dog with a tranquilizer dart in a treehouse, using ether to knock out a perv on the second floor, rigging the backyard grill to engulf whoever is unlucky enough to start it in flames, and even more. It is the Hitman experience in microcosm. Simple objectives, wide-ranging options and tactics on how to achieve those simple objectives. The only level that really stands out as being lesser than the others is A Murder of Crows. It's Blood Money's technical showcase with some pretty impressive crowds and digital NPCs on the screen for the time. Nowadays, it's just hokey and quaint, and unfortunately this poorly aging crowd tech ended up influencing the design of the level to go along with it. This is one of the only levels in the series to inject some RNG into the formula of the level, and the results are very frustrating and limiting. Now in some ways, this isn't so bad. The way it works is that you have three separate targets to take out, all spread across the map in hidden buildings, and a diamond briefcase to locate. When you take out Angelina Mason, she drops a radio which will locate a hidden target on your map. I kind of like this because replaying the level is a little different every time. You can never be quite sure where Raymond will be located, and it requires you to pick out Angelina from the crowd and follow her to a secluded area. The problem is with the crow with a diamond briefcase, because his path is randomized as well, which requires a lengthy, tedious stalking sequence at the start of every level. He always ends up in the same place, this little side alley that connects to all four main streets, but the amount of time for him to get there can take three, four times as long depending on the route he takes. Another huge problem is that this alley has a cop that circles the area, and you can never really nail down the timing on when he's going to show up because of the huge variance of the crow's path. Because there is no cover or any real sign of when the officer is going to approach, the only option is just to wing it and get the briefcase out of there as soon as possible. Random elements do not gel well with Hitman's design. It's hyper-focused on timing and manipulating AI patterns. Taking that out of the player's hands results in some unfortunate clunkiness in this level. This level also has one of the more adorably quaint kills in the series by dropping a piano on Angelina like it's an old Looney Tunes cartoon. Hitman Contracts was oppressively macabre, and Hitman 2 was very straightforwardly military or spy themed. Hitman Blood Money is the first game in the series to introduce some dark comedy in the way it presents these precarious accident kills. The best example of this is on the level Curtains Down. Your main target is an opera singer who's about to be executed on stage in dramatic fashion. Literally. You can shoot him just as the sound of the gunshot plays, preferably in a hidden position. You can take his captor's costume and shoot him yourself on stage. Or you can stage an elaborate accident by swapping out the prop gun for a real gun and have the actor be responsible for the murder. It's these accident kills that serve as Blood Money's unique trademark among other games in this series. Most levels have some variation, like feeding the father until death to us part to alligators, rigging a backyard grill to set a wife on fire in a new life, or rigging a light show and dance with the devil to set Vonna Ketlin on fire and then dropped into a tank with a great white shark. What's most satisfying about the accident kills is that they are premeditated and require a greater amount of planning and deception than a more conventional kill takes. To score a fiber wire or a silver baller kill, all that is really required is to separate the target from any other NPCs. Accident kills are instead done in the open, so you have to very carefully observe the AI patterns for interactions with potential objects that could result in their death and then figure out how to time it without blowing your cover in the process. It's a completely different play experience than past titles. That's not to say that good old-fashioned conventional kills are out of the question either. One of Blood Money's most notable and unique systems of the series is its insanely over-designed and gratuitous weapon customization system. You are able to personalize your weapons to a degree that isn't seen often outside of role-playing games or tactical military shooters aiming for realism. The amount of swappable parts and the multiple levels and benefits and drawbacks of each part is staggering. So much so that you can create weapons with entirely different looks and entirely different stats for different playstyles. You can give the Silver Baller an enormous long slide, extended mag, laser sight, and magnum ammo, or a silencer, scope, and low velocity ammo, or any variation of each depending on how you choose. By the end of the game, my Silver Baller looked ridiculous, but it was distinctly my pistol with a precarious concoction of weapon upgrades that I chose for myself to personalize my gear. 
It's a system that the series never used previously and never uses again, and it's baffling to me that it wasn't adopted in the later titles. So Hitman Blood Money crushes it in terms of level design and systems. When it comes to its narrative, it's largely the same as past titles. It's very much in the background, underdeveloped but also unobtrusive and harmless. The story is structured very similarly to Contracts, with each mission demonstrating a flashback to an earlier event in the story, only this time being narrated by a retired FBI agent relaying this information to a journalist. In this story, 47 is already dead. This game details his exploits in America before being captured and killed. Except, this is a Hitman game. Obviously, he's not really dead. So the final level of the game is another explosive shootout like Contracts and Silent Assassin before it, only this time rounding out all the other games and providing satisfying and complete closure in a way that is incredibly appropriate for the series. Diana uses the fake death serum on 47, the same one that he used in an earlier mission to smuggle another agent past security. She places his silver ballers on him just before he wakes up, and now it's up to 47 to take out all the witnesses on the secluded burial island and walk out unscathed. It's perfect. 47 eliminates all of his enemies in one fell swoop and walks away from the agency, free to pursue contracts independently. If it wasn't for a later game in the series, Blood Money would be the uncontested best game in the franchise. It builds off the successes and failures of past titles in a way that is extremely well considered, and provides an experience that is so much more playable in a modern environment than any of the past titles. More than that, this game is enduringly enjoyable. Its level design and systems are arguably the best in the series, and it is to be commended for how it so perfectly concluded the series in a narratively consistent tone. The Hitman franchise so far has been a largely linear journey. Each game is a little bit better than the last, slowly building and improving until reaching the series' unequivocal peak. It's from this point on that that journey becomes murky and much less easy to structure in a straight line. Hitman Absolution is a game with an identity crisis. With a new publisher wanting to make Hitman a big sales series in the vein of Splinter Cell and Assassin's Creed, Absolution's design ethos is muddled and confused so totally that it nearly killed the series. It is a mess. It is the only true unmitigated disaster in the series. It is a game that has no confidence in the strengths of the franchise and instead commits itself to desperately chasing trends in order to be like every other popular game on the market. Say what you will about the earlier Hitman game's clunkiness, and I have plenty, but I never doubted their artistic confidence and coherence. Those games knew exactly what they wanted to be, however flawed that vision may have been. This game is scattershot and myopic. It struggles severely to find its footing in the era of the cinematic video game trend of the early 2010s. This influence and drive to be cinematic is its most immediately obvious and aggressive flaw. Aggressive in how it pummels the player relentlessly with awful dialogue and hideous sepia-toned grindhouse pre-rendered cutscenes, and dirty people saying dirty things unironically dirty. Every cutscene in this game is cringe-inducingly miserable and disgusting. It is the worst combination of bad, self-serious dialogue and a thoroughly unpleasant, cynical tone. So much of the dialogue in this game sounds like in a different game it might not be taking itself so seriously. Yeehaw! I'll tell you, I don't ordinarily yeehaw, but this is a fucking yeehaw! Fucking Christmas! But cartoonishly evil bad guys doing cartoonishly evil things doesn't seem so innocent and harmless. Over a gray and musty filter and a dark and rumbling score complete with inception bombs. Now Hitman has always had its roots in the underbelly of crime and filth. Hitman Contracts especially has a severely dark and encompassing tone, but it was subtle. 
It was all in the locations, the score, which dripped a twisted ambience on the experience slowly, methodically. This game attempts to convince you that it's dark and gritty in the most obnoxious and infantile way possible. Who the fuck would dare fuck with me? Are you fucking kidding me? God damn it! You call Jade, tell her to set up the ransom right now. And call the sheriff, tell him I want my boy back. What the fuck I pay him for, goddamn fucking... Characters swear after every other word for no other reason than to cement it as mature, and the villains are so over the top in their performances that it comes off as lame. The score compounds this further, being an endless procession of sinister strings and French horn groans. It is the most one-note soundtrack of the series, failing to underscore the tension and mystery of early titles. This is the first title in the series to leave Jesper Kidd behind, and oh boy is it obvious. The sound in general is tonally all off compared to the earlier titles. It's big, it's loud, and it doesn't value silence the same way the previous games did. Constant explosions, loud stings of music, and boisterous crowds and ambient dialogue drown out the tension of being somewhere you shouldn't be. So much of the earlier Hitman games is complete silence, or at least accentuated by Kid's purposely subtle ambient score. It wasn't meant to dominate the experience, but accentuate the grit and mystery of its locations. Hitman Absolution's locations visually look incredible. Some of them are insanely detailed and show off some genuinely beautiful lighting effects. And it one-ups the previous game with crowd tech that makes Hitman Blood Money look absolutely primitive. But I have to think all of this new tech and detail came with a cost, and not just financially. Absolution's biggest new feature is both a symptom of its misguided, trend-chasing design and the infection that can be traced to almost every major design flaw in the game. Instinct is Absolution's replacement for the detailed overhead maps of previous games. It's obviously taken from the Detective Vision in the Batman Arkham series or the Eagle Vision in Assassin's Creed. It allows you to see objectives, guards, and interactable items through walls. On the surface, this doesn't seem too bad. The map screen in earlier Hitman games certainly wasn't elegant, and having to stare at a grey screen half the time is not exactly the best way to immerse players in the game. The problem is that the developers didn't just leave it at that a quick way to locate important information. Instead, Instinct is tied into the disguise system as a way to blend in. Yes, unfortunately, Absolution decided to abandon Blood Money's improved disguise system with managing notoriety, and has returned to the days of being terrified of narrow hallways and constantly having to watch out for other guards with the same uniform as you. It's not as bad as Silent Assassin actually giving you a reliable indicator tracking detection, but it's incredibly disappointing to see the game throw away the best mechanical improvement its predecessor made. How it works is that your instinct meter is drained whenever you use it to pass a nearby guard. It's not unlimited, but if you ration it reasonably, it allows you to just bypass entire levels altogether, just walking in a straight line holding the control key all the way to the exit. The instinct feature is a failure on all levels. Hitman is supposed to be all about exploration and discovery, about learning its complex guard patterns and design through and through and exploiting them to take out your target. The instinct feature neuters this to the point where it doesn't even feel like a Hitman game anymore. Allowing you to see everything important through walls defeats the point of exploration as you can just hit one key and see everything important on the level right from the start and regressing in the disguise system discourages exploration because it increases the chances of getting caught and dragging out the levels more than it should. It is the single worst decision in the game and one that breaks the fundamental experience of the series. Well why don't you just turn it off, you say? The problem is more complicated than that. Absolution is designed entirely around the fucking instinct feature. Levels in previous games, even though they could be obnoxious and could have wasted space and maze-like structures, it was all in service of making each level feel like a place. A real, tangible, living place and not just a video game level abstracted and designed for gameplay's sake. It meant that you don't need x-ray vision or patronizing handholding to figure out how to navigate levels. You need a key to a room? You go to the front desk and ask for one like a real person, or you follow around the hotel staff and take the key from them. You are allowed to solve problems yourself in a realistic, practical way, and the levels are laid out in a way that makes logical sense. The instinct feature is not only a problem in gameplay, but in level design. 
It destroys the level design, corrupts and twists it in a way to serve the feature so thoroughly that what the game is left with is chains of tiny indistinct chunks that are broken up with constant loading screens and simplified objectives and options to accommodate for the new tech and the instinct feature's malevolent chokehold. Let's look at the Terminus Hotel for example. In any other Hitman game, this would be one level. Maybe a couple different ways to enter the building, maybe a disguise opportunity around the back, a large multi-story complex with optional rooms and encounters designed for alternate playstyles and options. In Absolution, it's basically three levels. The first is the streets in the first floor, but then is broken up by a loading screen with an elevator. Then you have to sneak past about five guards before another level starts. This is the unfortunate theme with Absolution's levels. They are broken up by constant loading screens. Because the instinct feature needs to highlight multiple paths at a time, levels are designed small enough to feature all of your major targets and interactable objects in a 360 view. I don't think the technical limitations of consoles helped either. These levels are meant to be chewed up and thrown away every few minutes instead of the methodical large-scale planning and intimacy with the environment that previous levels entailed. It's hugely disappointing and saps the series of its most distinctive features, the level design, the disguise system, and complicated AI patterns. Now that's not to say that every level suffers the same fate. I don't think there's any levels in this game that can match any solid individual level from the previous games, but occasionally, it shows you something so visually spectacular and unique among Hitman games that it compensates for the total lack of large-scale classic Hitman levels. This level where you have to evade the police while waiting for a train to escape is an example of Absolution's scattershot, rapid-fire level design actually working in its favor and doing something interestingly unique among Hitman games. Because the disguise system is not foolproof, the roaming police circle the train platform scanning through the crowds for 47. You have to be constantly aware and mobile during the wait for the train. It's extremely tense and the visuals are gorgeous. It's the best video game adaptation of Jason Bourne that I've ever seen, taking the social stealth mechanics and applying them to large-scale city crowds instead of more intimate one-on-one -on -one encounters. One of Absolution's dumbest elements, the Kung Fu Nuns the game heavily showcased in its advertising, actually turns out to be one of its best levels. Stalking nuns and avoiding guards with flashlights through a cornfield where, yes, a fucking scarecrow disguise exists that you can use. It only takes a few minutes being the second part of a chain of levels, but it's these levels where Absolution is at its best, using its smaller scale to experiment more freely with new ideas, instead of having to create one massive, consistent space. And the best level in the game, I think, is the R&D lab, which manages to use a condensed level for some of the best accident kills in the series, using some of the experimental tech against their creators. This doctor is working on a cure for baldness, which you can use against him to burn his scalp off by mixing his chemicals behind his back. Or you can trip an experimental electrical cannon, and you can use the second doctor's own robotic creations against him in an ironic reversal. It's a very small level in terms of physical size, it's a spiral staircase with a few different rooms and the ground level, but it's jam-packed with options and creative kills, to the point where it even makes blood money look limited by comparison, at least in terms of accidental kill options. And also, this kill on the penthouse level is just awesome. But ultimately, it's rare when a level actually presents something that works with a new formula. The vast majority of Absolution's levels feel like third-rate Splinter Cell Conviction knockoffs. Speaking of Splinter Cell Conviction, I can't help but think that it shares some of the blame, because Absolution's story hook is one that first manifested in that game, Agent 47, On The Run. It's not a terrible idea, and it does actually work into the gameplay by taking away 47's pre-mission loadouts. One of Absolution's best ideas is that random objects like wrenches and hammers and screwdrivers can now be used both as weapons and as distraction objects, and you are encouraged to pick up everything you find and use it to your advantage. Now you could use these items in previous games as well, but they were extremely rare and also glitchy. The hedge clippers on A New Life actually break the game. In Absolution, they are everywhere, and it fits into the theme of 47 having to use his wits and his training while on the run from the agency. The problem is that the execution of this idea is just as dumb and obnoxious as the game's style. The first mission of the game sees 47 contracted to kill Diana, your trusted overseer, for the past four games. When she's dying, she tells 47 to betray the agency and run away with her daughter who she sacrificed herself to protect. 
Her daughter is another product of genetics experiments, and this apparently is enough for 47 to betray the agency that employed him for years and go on the run to protect this girl that he's never met. He's even forced to trade his silver bars for information later, which is just such a gross misunderstanding of the character. I get it, the idea is that 47 feels bad for Victoria because she was subjected to the same cruel experiments as him, but in the past four games, 47 never really shows that he's bothered by it. He's an amoral, asexual, emotionless killer, and it's expressed in everything from his actions to David Bateson's brilliant, cold, detached performance. This is simply the wrong series and the wrong character to do this kind of story. It doesn't work, and 47 and Victoria have a total of about five scenes together, none of which carry any kind of emotional weight at all. This might not have been so bad if it was confined to brief, skippable interludes between missions that don't affect the mission design or the pacing. All Hitman games have a story. Hitman 2 is about saving Father Vittorio. Hitman Contracts is about a series of fragmented flashbacks eventually leading to 47 waking up in his hotel room in the wake of a failed mission. Hitman Blood Money is about a journalist learning about a former head of the FBI's experience tracking and killing 47, and then learning how much of a grave mistake they've made. But none of this ever really impacted the gameplay besides the first and last missions of each game being a little more story-driven than the rest. The story in these games has never been remarkable, but the developers knew this and relegated the story to brief cutscenes between missions without it driving the game design. Hitman Absolution is the first game in the series to let the story drive the game design. Some of that resulted in some novel and effective ideas, but the damage done to the level design and the stealth mechanics is beyond fixing. And the result is not only the worst game in the series, but one of the most misguided and weirdest stealth action titles that I have ever played. Running is noisy. The most surprising thing about Hitman 2016 is that it's actually not a complete failure. Everything leading up to this game's release pointed to a total disaster. It's a modernized reboot of the series, and don't even get me started on how that turned out for other stealth series. It's got the same overbearing publisher that presumably caused issues with Absolution, and it was to be released episodically with one level at a time over a period of months. It would scrap the entire story progression of the five previous titles and bring things back to the beginning with a new composer, and a new, more ubiquitous style made for mass appeal. And yet Hitman 2016? Hitman 2016 is the best Hitman game. Yeah. Now, I still prefer individual elements in some of the previous titles over this reboot. I still think Contracts has the best atmosphere and score, and Blood Money still has the ridiculously overcomplicated weapon customization and a stronger forward momentum in the plot and pacing. But Hitman 2016's level design is so good, so unbelievably complex, dense, detailed, and beautiful, and this really hurts to say, but it damn near makes Blood Money obsolete. You are obsolete. But I'm not. I'm not obsolete. You are obsolete. Obsolete. You are obsolete. And keep in mind, Blood Money is one of my favorite games of all time. This game's levels are that good. Five out of six of its levels are truly top-tier Hitman levels, and I'd go so far as to say two of them are straight-up masterpieces, and unquestionably the best the series has to offer. We'll start with Sapienza, which is my personal favorite level in the series. This level is insane in terms of detail and scope. I said earlier that every Hitman level is like a meticulous recreation of a real living place. Sapienza is an entire local chunk of a coastal Italian town. It has a main street with optional buildings to explore, including an ice cream shop, a town hall and a clock tower with a hippie living at the top, a clothing store, bathrooms, a beach, a graveyard, and a church, and none of these contain any of your three main targets. This is all totally optional, yet far from pointless. It's easy to make a large map for the sake of it being large. It's incredibly difficult to make a map this large in physical size and have every single square inch of it be made with precision and care and purpose. All of these optional areas contain things that make them worthwhile endeavors and ways to replay the level differently. The ice cream shop allows you to get a disguise for poisoning the psychiatrist drink which allows you to score his disguise and then get a unique kill for it. The town hall has a clock tower with a hippie at the top who has a joint that you can actually swap out for Francesca's cigarettes. 
The clothing shop has a mansion guard disguise. The bathrooms are used to separate your targets from view, and the church has a scientist disguise for accessing the biolab under the mansion. None of it is superfluous. It's all important and well-designed options on how to access the mansion and the biolab. The amount of ways to assassinate the main target is bordering on excessive, but every single option was planned out and accounted for. Smother him during his appointment with a psychiatrist, poison his spaghetti sauce, snipe him, shoot him with a cannon, replace his golf ball with an exploding golf ball, kill him Fargo style, steal a personal videotape and play it which makes all his guards leave while you remain in the room disguised as a fucking plague doctor with an antique knife. Blood Money, at its best, would have maybe two or three of these options. The way most targets work in these games is walking these huge roaming AI patterns where every few steps they come in contact with a new option for assassination. It not only gives variety and replayability to each level, but eliminates much of the tedium of waiting around for the one thought out option to surface itself. And yet the level still has two more main areas, the mansion with the two main targets and the biolab underneath. No other Hitman level I've played has this many options for virtually every task. I mean, there's six disguise options just to get into the mansion, not even counting the other paths on the rooftops or from the beach entrance. It's unbelievable the amount of time I have spent on this level alone. I think I've spent more time just replaying this level than I spent on my entire playthrough of Absolution. It's that good of a level. Hokkaido is the other level that I can't really find a major fault in. It's on a smaller scale than Sapienza, but ends up being just as polished and complex. The only minor issue lies with the episode's gimmick, rooms are locked with outfits instead of using keycards and lockpicks. This opens the way for some creative bypasses, such as scaling the outside of the building, but can also cause minor frustration when doors right next to each other need two different disguises to enter. Nitpick aside, Hokkaido is brilliant. It's a secluded hospital for elite patients that operates outside of the law or medical regulations that confine countries, able to do experiments with stem cells and riskier transplants that a state-run hospital is banned from doing. Your main target is undergoing one of these operations with an experimental heart transplant, so naturally, you are given tons of opportunities for unique kills with him lying on the operating table. Take over as the surgeon and kill him with the robotic equipment, poison his stem cell flow, disable his life support and AI backups, and my favorite, reveal yourself as 47 just before he dies. Soders is your nemesis at the agency, so it's sweet, sweet poetic justice for him to be the final contract. It's one of the only times in the series where your target is given personal depth instead of just being a nameless nobody for money. I like the visuals and variety of Sapienza more, but if we are talking purely level layout here, then Hokkaido is actually the best. It does an amazing job at being both confined and isolationist, but still feeling expansive and surprisingly large. The inside of the facility feels very tight, but if you sneak into the outside areas, it reveals some surprisingly large swaths like this mountain pass and helicopter pad. Everything is laid out so logically and so consistently that it's one of the easiest levels to learn. As good as the levels in this game are, there's only one I feel fails to measure up to the rest. Marrakesh is unfocused, confused, and surprisingly limited despite being possibly the largest in terms of physical size. It's not terrible, it would be a higher up level in the early Hitman games, but it fails to measure up to the other incredible five levels. The biggest problem is just how much wasted space there is in this level. It's got this massive city square complete with a bazaar, a crowd of protesters, little shops and alleys and a cafe, but almost none of this is useful in the same way Sapienza maximized its space. There's a little apartment towards the west side that contains the headmaster's key which can open all the doors in the school where one of your main targets resides, but the rest of the little optional encounters and events aren't all that useful. There's a cameraman disguise and a couple of minor sequences, but it just doesn't use its space as efficiently as the other levels. And its options for assassinating the two main targets are uncharacteristically limited and more uninteresting than the other levels. There's a unique kill for both, disguising yourself as a prisoner to surprise the general in the school, and taking over as a massage therapist for Klaus in the embassy. But the other options are more about precariously timed up accidents that are a tedious pain to set up. You can drop a toilet on the general or electrocute Klaus, but it's just not as interesting as the exploding golf ball or watch on Colorado the fugu fish poisoning or birthday cake smothering in Bangkok. The two main areas of the level, the school and the embassy, don't have as much going on as the other levels either. The school especially is bone dry with the only real interesting things being the interrogation room and the general's office itself. 
The embassy has more going on with the camera crew in the back offices, but it's a shame how much lower quality this level feels than the others in the lineup. With the exception of Marrakesh, the level design is the best in the series, and this reboot thankfully doesn't stop there with the positives. It has the best method of detection in the series to date as well. It uses a hybrid format of Absolution and Blood Money's disguise systems. Instead of every guard with a similar uniform seeing through your disguise and no guards seeing through your disguise like in Blood Money with high enough notoriety, what Hitman 2016 does is handpicks specific NPCs throughout the level called Enforcers and gives them increased awareness. Commanders and higher-ups who personally know all their own staff possess the ability to see through your disguise, indicated with this little dot above their heads, but the rest are oblivious to your disguise, similar to Blood Money. It's extremely smart. They've solved the constant back and forth with the disguise system and found a middle ground that shares the best of both systems. You don't have to constantly be on the lookout for narrow hallways and feel much more free to explore hostile areas, but at the same time aren't completely safe and do have to keep a lookout for these specific observant NPCs. The cynic in me says they could have so easily screwed this up by making the system random and say that it increases replayability or something like that, but by handpicking the specific NPCs with this ability, it gives it consistency and familiarity which is perfect for the player working out their own strategies. The mechanics are virtually unchanged from Absolution, and as much as I made myself clear on how much I disliked that game, it wasn't because of the mechanics. Absolution was a step backward in design, but a big step up in terms of polish and basic playability. It feels even better here, pulling the camera back more than the claustrophobic FOV of its predecessor, and shooting and stabbing and strangling feels better than ever. They've made some changes to your equipment, and this is not as overwhelmingly positive as the other changes this reboot makes. It still doesn't bring back the weapon customization from Blood Money, which is a shame, but it also doesn't share the same total disregard for personalized loadouts and strategies like Absolution did. You can't customize individual weapons, but there are a ton of them this time, each a little different and with different properties that have significantly different effects. The Silver Baller has a silencer by default, but there are different levels of noise generated by gunfire, and you can't put a heavier silencer on the Silver Baller like in Blood Money. Instead, the Kruger Meyer 22 is the quietest pistol in the game. It has significantly less power and range than the Silver Baller, but ends up being slightly quieter. You have to unlock the Kruger Meyer through achieving mastery on Bangkok. How weapon and equipment upgrades work is that by completing challenges, you gain levels in mastery for a specific level. Complete enough challenges and you unlock a new level and unlock a piece of equipment or a weapon depending on the level. Explicitly spelling out all of the major assassination opportunities could be seen as a flaw, and it definitely is unless you do something in the options first. Turn off opportunities. It's the one bit of patronizing handholding in the game that alerts you whenever you overhear ambient dialogue or come in contact with an object or event that leads to one of these challenges. If it just alerted the player to an opportunity, it would be a minor issue, but it's the fact that it tracks and spells out the whole sequence of events step by step with objective markers seen through walls and everything. It robs the game and the series, really, of its best feature, exploration and discovery, figuring out fun and creative strategies yourself organically from scouring the game world. As long as you turn this off in the options menu, the challenges are a powerful incentive to replay the levels. I'm a huge fan of XP systems like this, one that reward the player for doing things off the beaten path and for connecting puzzle pieces across entire levels that may even be timed. The fact that it rewards the player with extremely useful and functional equipment is fantastic. It's the best way to segment unlocks in the game. Getting mastery on a level even unlocks different starting points and stash locations for smuggled in equipment. If you are going to replay the levels over and over again, it's so much more convenient and kills a lot of the tedium to avoid having to get the same disguise over and over. These were no doubt born out of the game's release schedule, which was released a level at a time over a period of months. Because of the long wait between episodes, they had to make sure one level was enough to keep players' interest until the next one. I have no doubt this is also a contributing factor to why the levels are as good as they are in this game. Instead of having a year or two to develop 10 to 12 levels, 
they had a few months to spend on a singular experience and then look at fan feedback and criticism which they could implement into the next one. I did not play Hitman 2016 on release because of the episodic format. I thought it was desperate and gimmicky and a result of pressure from the publisher which has a history of crowbarring in unnecessary restrictions that end up damaging their properties. But after spending over 50 hours with the game I have to admit, Hitman's format works surprisingly well in an episodic release schedule. Yes, Hitman 2016 has the least amount of levels in the series, but it cuts out all the fat. Usually Hitman games have around 4 or 5 levels that are great, and the rest range in quality pretty dramatically. By focusing the entire development team's efforts on a single level at a time, it ensured incredible quality and polish. Unfortunately though, publisher control did result in something this game could have done without. Hitman 2016 is programmed to be always online. It's so strange. The backlash against always online features was so strong that it basically destroyed the Xbox One. All of the games that were supposed to be always online have since backtracked or were scared off by the mobs of angry gamers upset for pretty justifiable reasons. This game is an artifact that somehow slipped through the cracks and made it to release without significant backlash for this completely unnecessary and restrictive feature. It's more pointless than usual because Hitman is a single player game. The only benefit you might receive from being connected to the internet is leaderboards, fan uploaded contracts, and the elusive targets which is a whole other problem of its own. It makes absolutely zero sense for this to be an always online game. Zero. I don't even understand what the publisher gets out of it other than getting themselves off for feeling like Big Brother. As of now, I have never experienced any major issues with the online connection. I've only been booted off the servers once or twice, which doesn't change anything if you are already in a mission. The problem I have concerns the future. If you start this game without an online connection, you don't have access to any of your unlocks. All those weapons and equipment and starting points that make the game so much more replayable are lost to you without an online connection. Servers are not cheap, and I worry what will happen to this game in the future once Square Enix decides they don't want to keep them running anymore. Will they just disable the always online function, or will this game's full function be saved by modders and pirates? It's a grave question that they could have easily avoided without this aggressively implemented, unnecessary feature. But that is an unfortunate bit of publisher oversight, not game design. As a game, Hitman 2016 is far and away the best in the series. In a series this inconsistent with so many ups and downs and changes to the basic formula, it's incredible how smart they've been at surgically cutting out all the mistakes and taking all the best elements to create what the series has always strived to be. It's what a reboot is supposed to do after all, but so rarely ends up being this totally successful. Hitman 2, no not that one, just released a few weeks ago and I haven't played it yet, but it seems like all signs were pointing in the right direction. It seems like it's taking the success of 2016 and applying it to a full-scale, classic Hitman game released in full. The episodic Hitman structure helped 2016 a lot in some ways, but with the lessons learned from that game, the future for the Hitman series looks bright. Unlike how I feel with Splinter Cell or Thief or Metal Gear Solid, I can say without hesitation that I am confidently looking forward to what IO Interactive can do with Hitman in the future and evolve this social stealth formula into something that can even make Hitman 2016 seem like a relic from the past. They did it before, I hope they can do it again.